not sure if I'm lucky last or the graveyard shift yet, but um, thank you all for your attention. This is the final talk of the day. Um, it continues very nicely on from Dennis's talk there because, again, it highlights the importance of understanding your background geology and levelling um, when thinking about your soil sampling data. Um, it's entitled Interpretive Mapping Using Geophysical and Soil Geochemical Data to Maximise Competence in Exploration Targeting. Um, it's a case study of a magmatic nickel exploration project um, up in Queensland. So exploration targeting using surface geochemistry is not always a simple or a straightforward task. And as you've heard us discuss several times throughout today, and as is shown on this diagram here, there are many things to be considered at both the targeting, the planning, the interpretation phase to get the most out of that geochemical data that you've collected. Although some companies do have a really robust um, and reliable way of targeting using surface geochemistry, my experience is that we actually tend to struggle um, with the process. And that's mainly because we underutilize the available geophysical, geological data. And we, we attempt to interpret our geochemical data, our surface geochemical data in isolation. So for example, we basically, we just, we get our soil sample results back and we just got out chasing and drilling our high copper or our high lead or zinc. So the aim of this talk is to attempt to demonstrate a more thorough and robust exploration targeting process. The process here that was undertake, undertaken to maximize success for magmatic nickel copper identification, but it will be applicable to many different deposit types using different elements, obviously. Going right back to a talk early on in the day by Simon, um, a very important thing to do when you're even prior to doing surface sampling is to understand your regolith and do your regolith map. I'd advise doing a prospectivity map from your regolith map, um, interpreting the soil data, and I'll show you all about some of the things we need to consider here. And then the final body of my presentation is I'm going to show you a workflow that goes through those different stages, and then I'm going to show you the results, just to compare what we see in the soils versus what we actually see when we drill the rocks. So this is a location of um, the case study I'm showing you. So it was from Anglo-Americans ex Dido Prospect up in northern Queensland. Um, it's right on the edge of the Georgetown inlayer there near the Tasman line. It was initially thought to be prospective because it is close to a deep crystal structure and there were also a little smattering of olivine rich rocks in the area. I will tell you now that unfortunately, I said ex Anglo American, they're no longer there. Um, they drew the prospect and they only got sniffs. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't tell you an amazing story of this is the soil chemistry and then they found this deposit. But um, still, it doesn't matter for this case study, it's still very valid. So, first things first, make a regolith map. Um, You'll see on this regolith map, there's a regolith map on the right hand side. I learned this morning that putting on your terrain is a good idea and I would strongly recommend that. So this regolith map, it was made with multiple layers and that was how, how I would advise you to do this. Um, I'm not an expert in this, but um, the process of making a regolith map, ground check what you see, but there's a lot of available data, um, freely available data now that can help you with this. So this map, the layers I used here was the basement geology, um, the magnetics to try and pick out any mafic rocks essentially, Google images, DEM, Aster, as Simon talked about Aster and Landsat this morning, and then the radiometrics. And if you come here, here, just the radiometrics alone with that regolith map, you can see that the large alluvial channels, they've been picked out easily in the radiometrics. The dark areas um, on the radiometric maps, they're your mafic body. So you can start to see even just very quickly how these um, images can help. Also looking for things like changes in vegetation, different vegetation grow over different um, geologies, as we all know. So even doing things like that and using your different Landsat and your different Landsat processing and channels can be really helpful there. So we've got, a, we've got our regolith map, excellent. 
So the next step I do is I make a prospectivity map and this is essentially helping me knowing where to focus my soil sampling. In this example, I use my airborne geophysics and my basement geology. I'm looking for nickel, so I was looking for my mafix and ultramafic intrusions. Um, so I ha they were easily um, visible on the mags, so I've highlighted them there in green. There was about 20 bodies there, some of which were two, three kilometres long. Others are very small, so I highlighted them. Then the next step is to see what are their relationships to, to cover. So I'm, this is pre-planning of my soil sample. So basically I need to decide, can I soil sample over these? Or do these go into the too hard booker? Are they undercover and they're too hard to attempt to explore with soil sampling because we, we're unlikely to see through that cover? You've already seen there's a large, large alluvial channel that runs right the way through this area. And you can see that quite a few of these disappear. They disappear under that alluvium, um, and we didn't want to soil sample that. But fortunately for us, the two larger um, intrusions in the centre of the tenement area there, they were actually amenable to soil sampling, so that's what we did. We went out and soil sampled over them. Decisions to make here, things like size of grid. We originally did quite a widely spaced grid, um, basically just seeing if we could see different geochemical signatures across these and that was successful so we went back in we're looking for nickel as I said nickel deposits you will get dispersion um, in the surface or you hope you will but their signal can be quite small because we don't get that alteration dispersion generally so we did a quite um, close space grid of 200 by 50 meters we sampled fairly shallow 5 to 15 centimeters again we want to see a bit of that lateral movement as well and we used aqua regio, we used multi-element. And another thing to stress again, 56 elements. So we pretty much got the whole package. And the idea here is to do more than just go out and look for your commodity elements. We want to be able to use this data, even at soil sampling um, level, to try and map, to try and map our basement geology through that cover. So that was my aim here. And you never know what elements you're going to be able to use until you start playing with the data. So my recommendation is get these packages. They're readily available now. They're not too expensive. As I said earlier in my EDA talk, the first thing I usually do after I've done my QAQC and I've cleaned all my data is I plot up maps. In this case, I'm looking for mafix, so the elements I chose here, magne magnesium, chrome, nickel. In this area, you'll, you'll actually see that the magnesium, it's, it's not too mobile, which is quite surprising, so I could use that. And you can instantly see on this percentile maps that there's a relationship between your magnesium and your chrome and your nickel. The black lines on here are marking the outlines of the intrusions or the, what we thought were intrusions based on the geophysics. So in the north, that large northern intrusion, it's got high magnesium, it's got high chrome, it's got high nickel. But interesting, the one that we marked in the south, it doesn't have none of the elements, none of these elements that I associate with mafix or ultra mafix are high in this area. And that was actually quite curious, looking at those elements alone. So I did some more work and played around and then I decided to, um, after quite a bit of playing, to do some cluster analysis. Um, as I said, you tend to know before you get to these advanced techniques where you're going and what your interpretation will be, but this was a really, really interesting example of how cluster analysis worked very well. So I've taken the soils over these two intrusions, chosen 15 elements related to mafic through to felsic rocks. I'm trying to pull out the different intrusions and stuck them into a cluster analysis, and that's automatically assigned it to these three groups here, um, four groups, sorry, the black is... Um, these intrusions are within a more um, felsic rock, and that's the black group here, cluster four. So the cluster analysis did a really excellent job of pulling out those two intrusions, as I say, just based on the, the soil sampling data alone. Um, so the southern intrusion, interestingly, it's very, the soils over that are very geochemically different. As I say, we weren't sure what was happening there at first, but with the cluster analysis and other interpretation, what we found was that, that the soils over that were um, very high in iron and ven vanadium and titanium. And I should state here that um, this area, this southern intrusion, is completely under cover. The cover is probably up to about 5 to 10 metres thick in this area. There is no outcrop, so we really didn't know what to expect in this area. The northern intrusion, there are some outcrops there. They're olivine bearing, so we did know we were going to be dealing... Um, 
with a mafic intrusion in that area. But what is also really interesting in the cluster analysis is you're starting to see some strange zonation looking patterns in your soils alone. Um, and we could actually explain that when we went back and looked at the geology. So it's actually doing something in relation to the basement geology here. So effectively, just from the soils alone, we had an idea that this northern intrusion is probably pretty primitive. Maybe has an ultramafic core with a more mafic um, surround. And the southern intrusion, assuming the soil was representative of that intrusion, we were thinking it was a much more evolved intrusion, intrusion of types. Maybe it's very iron rich, or maybe some magnetite um, intrusion. So what's the implications for targeting? Well, if you look at the Tukey plots here, we're looking for nickel. So nickel, copper, platinum, palladium, they're, they're commonly the elements I use when I'm looking at soil samples to look for um, magmatic nickel sulfide. So the first issue you see here, that when we look at the nickel Tukey plot, which is in the top left-hand side, the intrusion in the north, it has much higher nickel than the intrusion in the south. And that does not necessarily reflect the fact that the northern intrusion is fertile or mineralized and the southern is not. It's simply reflecting the fact that they have different background silicate. They're both mafic, but the northern one has higher olivine. And as I said, this is a, a problem of such um, when you're looking for nickel because the olivine has your nickel and it's actually hard to tell an ultramafic intrusion from a mineralized intrusion. But if we don't deal with this data, if we don't do some leveling and we're starting looking just at percentiles for nickel, we're going to entirely miss that southern intrusion, which is not smart because nickel doesn't, have, nickel doesn't just occur in ultramafics. It, there's many examples where it's in troctolites and less mafic rocks um, and less primitive rocks. So we didn't want to just basically get rid of that area. It's still potentially prospective. So what we did effectively is we had to level. Um, there are multiple ways of leveling. In this example here, all I have done is done percentile separately for each of the intrusions. So what I'm trying to do is get rid of that background, that changing background levels of nickel to actually be able to see through the olivine and see through the, the background geology and look for anomalies. So if you look at the scale bar here, for the percentiles, the northern intrusion, the 90th percentile there is 326 ppm nickel, whereas the southern's only 26 PM, ppm nickel. So I'm, I'm effectively leveling. And what I usually do in this case too, another way of finding my statistically robust outliers is that I've taken my Tugi plots on my previous slide and I've identified the outliers separately for each of those separate intrusions and I plotted them up on my map. This slide, it's Mike's favorite plot. It's an RGB for nickel. Um, so I've used nickel, copper, platinum. And as Mike described earlier, effectively, what you're doing here, if you look at the key of the triangle, um, which is the key to go with the map. So effectively, the coloration is anything that is just nickel over the 90th percentile is red. Anything that's nickel plus copper is yellow. Anything that's just copper is green. And then anything that's white, um, that's got nickel, copper, and platinum all above the 90th percentile. So I use that quite commonly to look for um, numerous elements of interest in an ore deposit. If you were looking for porphyry copper, you might do copper, gold, molly, or something like that. If you're looking for a gold, you might use gold plus your pathfinders, gold arsenic, tellurium, something like that. So it's just a really nice visual way of seeing um, some target areas. And what happened here, thankfully, um, unfortunately for this case study, is that the areas that had the high nickel, copper, platinum, um, I should state here, this RGB, again, was done separately for the two intrusions. So the soils are effectively leveled over here. And both intrusions were drilled. So even though the soils were lower over the southern intrusion, because we said it's still fertile, it still has anomalies for its background level. They're low, but they're still potentially there. Both intrusions were actually drilled. So it means that some of the, the hypotheses based on the soil geochem were actually tested. So all I was going to show you from this is that effectively, we fairly accurately mapped those different changes in geology um, just from the surface. So that northern intrusion that in the soil, it was your magnesium, your nickel, your chrome-rich intrusion. When we drilled it, 
guess what? That's exactly what it was. It was ultramafix um, through to troxolites. As I said, the nickel concentrations and copper were pretty low, but there was little spikes there. The southern intrusion was a really interesting intrusion. And as I said, we, we saw from the soil that it had a lot of iron, and that's exactly what we got when we drilled it. It was this incredibly rich, um, magnetite ilmenite rich, very um, evolved um, 